case definitions are a set of rules that allow investigators and clinicians to determine who has and who has not an illness. They are a foundation for studying any illness, like a deck of cards. They are at the bottom level that must be sturdy. This is an example of what a case definition should look like. It should have a sturdy foundation so the top can be more sturdy. If there are ambiguities with case definitions, samples of patients will be different on fundamental aspects of an illness, resulting in difficulties replicating findings across different labs, estimating the prevalence of the illness, consistently identifying biomarkers, and determining which treatments help patients. The nature of the problem before us is that there are currently multiple case definitions. CFS, ME-CFS, ME-SCID, each has different criteria and different names. Over 20 have been developed, but are rarely guided by the scientific method. Our challenge is to decide in which case definitions for clinical and research criteria and which names to use. We need to employ standardized instruments for assessing symptoms. We need standardized instruments to assess agreed upon criteria regarding symptoms and common data elements. In other words, we need the instruments as well as the symptoms as well as the common data elements. We need to specify thresholds regarding whether or not a particular symptom is severe and frequent enough to meet criteria. Failure to do any of these things will compromise our efforts at developing case definitions and using them effectively. First, an overview. Fatigue and many somatic symptoms are very common among the healthy individuals. For example, short-term fatigue is experienced by 15 to 25 percent of the population at any one time. The key question is, is it fatigue that's the focus of our work, or are we studying something more profound, such as post-exertional malaise and profound cognitive impairment? Our task regarding case definitions, about 4 to 5 percent of the population, or 1 out of 20 people, currently experience 6 or more months of fatigue. Which individuals have ME and CFS among those 4 to 5 percent of the population? If we bring in all such patients into our studies, we'd be using the Oxford criteria, and we certainly have seen problems with that with the PACE trial. So first, we need to focus on the FACUDA criteria. And as you all know, we need, we need to have four out of eight key symptoms. And yet the three at the bottom in yellow are the key symptoms of this illness. So as we know, a person could easily have four symptoms at the top be diagnosed with Bakuda and not have the core symptoms of this illness. By not requiring post-exertional malaise, memory and concentration problems, and unrefreshing sleep, we have significant reliability issues as well as validity. A recent study done looked at 53 studies using Bakuda criteria and, find, and found these three critical symptoms had variable rates, PEM from 25 to 100 percent, neurocognitive deficits from 16 to 100 percent, unrefreshing sleep from 16 to 100 percent. So clearly this variability is unacceptable for these cardinal key symptoms of ME. The problem with criterion variants, patients with CFS identified by FACUDA criteria may not share many core symptoms. Let's give an example. Patient one has sore throats, tender lymph nodes, joint and muscle pain, but not unrefreshing sleep, memory, concentration problems, and PEM. Does that person have ME or CFS? Patient two has unrefreshing sleep, memory, concentration problems, and post-exertional malaise. I would say patient two is more likely to have what we think of as ME. We've seen the development of empiric criteria by Reeves in 2005 to try to operationalize Bakuda. This is known as the empiric CFS criteria. Reeves used three standardized instruments to measure symptoms, fatigue, and disability. But both FACUDA and the Reeves empiric criteria do not require key symptoms. So criteria could identify individuals with solely a primary psychiatric condition, in my opinion. Let's give an example. A person with solely major depressive disorder could be diagnosed with ME and CFS. Depression often involves chronic fatigue and several minor symptoms like unrefreshing sleep, joint pain, muscle pain, and impairment in concentration. So that person could, unfortunately, have a solely psychiatric condition and meet the CFS-Bakuda criteria. 
If you look at prevalence variability using FACUDA criteria, you see rates in community-based samples that go from 0.24%, 0.42%, up to 2.54% by Reeves, and 2.6% by British colleague Wesley. The most prevalent psychiatric disorders after anxiety are major depressive disorders with a one-month prevalence rate of 2.2%. Isn't that interesting that it's so close to CFS estimates below, 2.54% for the Reef study in Georgia and 2.6% for the Wesley study in Great Britain? How could CFS relevance, prevalence rates increase by tenfold? It's possible they identified individuals as having CFS who did not have key symptoms. It's also possible they brought into the sample those with the primary psychiatric condition. Again, look at these prevalence rates from four community-based studies, 0.24% to 2.6% within a very short period of time. The major problems with FACUDA criteria are exemplified by this Wesley study in 1997. Among those with CFS identified, only 64% had sleep disturbances and 63% had post-exertional malaise. Wesley CFS prevalence rate of 2.6%, 59% felt their illness might be due to psychological or psychosocial causes. But if psychological disorders were excluded, only 0.5% of the sample would have CFS. So one final problem, in the lack of implementation of critical features of the FACUDA criteria. And that is, some patients who might meet four symptom criteria, they might have fatigue that was the result of exertion. They might have fatigue that's resolved with rest, and they might have fatigue that's not substantially reduced with, with activity. We'll go back to this issue again, um, but it is a problem not only with this criteria, but with others. So. There are a variety of reasons that can explain fatigue and clinical symptoms of the FACUDA criteria. For example, working multiple jobs and being overcommitted, life stress, health problems, medications, poor sleep hygiene, and deconditioning. An example, an adolescent stays up late playing video games and eating junk food until 2 a.m. every night. The child does not get enough sleep, evidences sleep difficulties, cognitive problems, and PEM. These are understandable lifestyle reasons for the symptoms. But the child meets the case definition criteria, but we don't think they really have CFS or ME. We need to avoid results of imprecision criteria, resulting in problems such as what occurred in some of the recent treatment trials. The Canadian criteria basically tried to fix this problem of lack of identification of core symptoms by requiring specific symptoms to occur, such as post-exertional malaise. And as you can see up on this slide, these particular symptoms are key, PEM, sleep, as well as neurocognitive manifestations. I won't go through all the list because I'm sure most of you are familiar with them at this point. The international consensus criteria also had a specification of symptoms, but they went from seven symptoms of the CCC to eight symptoms. Um, and you can see some of the areas that symptoms were part of. I won't go through all the details, but many of you are familiar with the MECC. We have compared case definitions with some large samples from our DePaul sample, a solved CFS biobank sample, Newcastle sample, um, as well as other samples that we have used, um, particularly from Norway. Consistent findings among the data sets, about 95% meet the FACUDA criteria, 75% meet the CCC criteria, 60% meet the case definition of MEICC. So more restrictive case definitions also have lower physical functioning on the SF36, a measure of disability. These are consistent findings across quite a few different data sets. There's also Ramsey's ME criteria, um, later operationalized to talk about physical or mental fatigue or muscle weakness after minimal exertion, um, circulatory impairment, and one or more symptoms involving the central nervous system and marked fluctuation of symptoms, which many of you are familiar with. When we've tried to operationalize the Ramsey criteria, um, we found only 24% met the ME criteria from those diagnosed with FACUDA. And that 24% were more functionally impaired than those who just met the FACUDA criteria. 
There are a number of empirical methods for identifying core symptoms. They range from factor analysis to cluster analysis, to artificial neural networks to network analyses and others. And I, I think many of you are familiar with some of those studies. Just to give you an example, factor analysis can determine which categories of symptoms should be required. And we found a four-factor solution with 788 patients. Our most recent work is actually over 1,000 patients. And we consistently find these three factors, cognitive dysfunction, post-exertional malaise, sleep, and a combined factor of neuroendocrine, autonomic, and immune areas. Symptoms that occur at lower rates than the core symptoms, and they might be better thought of subtypes of the illness. And we're currently doing research on those subtypes. And we actually have some rather interesting findings we hope to be presenting soon that one of my graduate students, Madison Sunquest, is working on. One of the things that can be done with these types of data sets is using machine learning or data mining that can uncover patterns in data that would not be evidence to humans because of the size and complexity of the data that can determine the types of symptoms that may be most useful in accurately diagnosing patients versus controls. And this is one example of machine learning. These are four symptoms that came out at different nodes. As you can see, those are four potential symptoms that could be used in a more simplified version of uh, symptoms to diagnose this illness. And you can again see PEM, um, neurocognitive problems and sleep, as well as fatigue, coming out as primary characteristics, items that differentiate patients from controls. Using this four symptom criteria, um, 62 were classified as meeting the empiric criteria, and fewer patients than by the Fakuda CFS criteria the Canadian criteria, about the same amount as the MEICC criteria. So in general, our work suggests that post-exertional malaise, neurocognitive, and neuro un unrefreshing sleep, non-refreshing sleep, these are the key symptoms, with others being possibly subtypes. I won't get into subtypes now, but um, maybe a future time we'll talk about them. The Institute of Medicine in the spring of 2005 to 2015 came up with a new clinical criteria called Systemic Exercise Intolerance Disease, SCID, and they said it should replace CFS. The IOM recommended four symptoms, substantial reductions or impairment in the ability to engage in pre-illness levels of occupational, educational, social, or personal activities, PEM, unrefreshing sleep, and at least one of the two following symptoms, cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. They identified a few core areas, as our team and others have found. We think that's a good thing. They had fewer domains that reduced some problems inherent in case definitions with seven or eight symptoms, and they're beginning specification of scoring rules and items. This task is just started and needs work, but it requires a case definition for specified sp symptoms. Let's look at more detail what some of these issues are. You can't just say a substantial reduction of impairment you can't just say persists for more than six months, accompanied by fatigue, which is often profound, is newer definite onset, not the result of ongoing exertion, it's not substantially alleviated by rest. All these topics need to be operationalized. None of them have been operationalized since 2015, and that's the problem, because everyone's going to use these criteria differently. Let's give you an example. What we do is we measure substantial reduction in functioning using the SF36 where we say three scores, real physical skill less than 50, less than equal 50, social functioning less than equal 62.5, vitality score less than equal 35. We operationalize it that way. We have some data to support those particular cutoffs. What about fulfilling lifelong fatigue? We ask the people to respond in the following manner to these three questions. If they respond yes to these three items, we say they have lifelong fatigue, but again, you have to operationalize how you're going to define it. You can't just say, if a person has lifelong fatigue, we exclude them. You have to indicate how you basically exclude them by answering what questions. Another question, fatigue is not substantially alleviated by rest. How do you operationalize it? We basically ask a person, is the person's problem with fatigue energy entirely went away with rest? If they say yes to that, they're excluded. Fatigue is the result of excessive exertion. You found that long working hours are correlated with burnout when working over 40 hours per week, 
and even stronger on working over 60 hours a week. Therefore, for us, individuals indicated that they combined work-related activities or household activities involved 60 more hours a week in the past four weeks. We excluded them. But again, you can see we operationalized it. We didn't just say fatigue is the result of excess, excessive exertion. PEM, that particular symptom, we have basically have frequency and severity criteria on an instrument we have called the DePaul Symptom Questionnaire. We'll call it the DSQ. And you have to have at least half the time the symptom and frequency and severity at least moderate. And these are some of the symptoms. Soreness after mild activity, feeling drained or sick after mild activity, minimum exercise makes you tired, a dead or heavy feeling after exercise, feeling mentally tired after slightest effort. So we operationalize it by particular criteria and particular items. Sleep dysfunction, again, frequency and severity, at least half the time, moderate severity on these types of items, on refreshing sleep and other items. Cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. Again, for neurocognitive impairment, we look at these particular type items, like difficulty paying attention, difficulty expressing thoughts in others. And for orthostatic intolerance, we have at least one of the following. Again, with frequency and severity, dizziness, feeling unsteady on one's feet, disturbed balance, and others. So the limitations is that these seed IOM criteria require a patient to have cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. But orthostatic intolerance does not evidence prevalence rates as high as the other proposed core symptoms, such as cognitive impairment. As an example, Light has found two subgroups of patients with CFS that can be identified by gene expression changes following exercise. The smallest subgroup contained most of the patients with CFS along with orthostatic intolerance. This might be better thought of as a subtype rather than a core symptom. Also, it's unclear with the IOM, IOM policy on exclusionary illnesses. It appears people who have the core symptoms would have SCID. Few, if any, exclusionary illnesses. Now they're treated as comorbid illnesses, unless the disease can explain all the symptoms. Using a community-based sample that had not been screened for exclusionary illnesses, the SCID prevalence rate, we estimate, would be 2.8 times greater than Fukuda, because 47% of those with melancholic depression met SCID IOM criteria, and 48% of those with the medical reason for their fatigue met SCID IOM criteria. It's based on a study we published a year and a half ago. We think that we need to finish the work of P2P, Pathways to Prevention. IOM does not specify core symptoms. I, sorry, IOM does specify core symptoms, um, but we need to reduce the exclusionary criteria um, because it has broadened the individuals identified. We now need to differentiate the wider IOM clinical criteria to identify a more homogeneous research criteria. So what we're suggesting is, of that 4% of individuals that we think has six or more months of fatigue, there's a clinical criteria, which is probably a large group. Maybe the IOM meets that, but a research criteria will probably be narrow, more focused, and more symptomatic. There are choices for a research criteria. Some recommend we can use one of a variety of research criteria and just report what is being used but trying to compare studies across labs will be more difficult. Each of hundreds of labs using different criteria to select patients will just introduce confusion. Alternatively, we could select one research criteria, an empirically based one, MEICC, CCC, Ramsey criteria, or the IOM clinical criteria with more exclusions, particularly the medical and psychiatric ones. To make things more complicated, we also need to come up with names for the clinical and research case definitions that have international favorable attitudes among patients, scientists, clinicians, and government officials. Lisa Petrison from Paradigm Change, the spring of 2015, conducted a patient survey. She found the majority of respondents expressed negative opinions about IOM's proposed name, SCID. Our, we have a recent poll done by our group that was published in 2016, where we looked at over 1,000 participants who lived in the U.S. or outside the U.S. We also found the majority of individuals were not in favor of either CFS or SCID. <coughs> the most favorable attitudes were found for ME, 
65 to 68 percent were favorable. That was the highest consensus among the patient community. It's also supported by scientific data suggesting that there's less negative attributions associated with ME. Those are two studies done by our group about 15 years ago. Two of the lowest rated criteria were the Procuda and the IOM. The highest approval ratings, were, the next highest approval ratings were for the CC Canadian consensus criteria with 58 to 64%, a data-driven approach, 57 to 59%, or the MEICC, 55 to 58%. So if we're thinking about case definitions, in terms of patients, what they felt that the Canadian criteria was actually the highest, and the MEICC was close to that, and the FACUD and the IOM were the lowest rated in terms of things that they would accept. So one possible classification system is that a research criteria identified by the term ME myalgic encephalomyelitis could be used. That is endorsed by the majority of patients, so we have support for that. The clinical criteria, patients that meet the IOM clinical criteria, um, may be with the subtype within this category identifying those with physical or medical reasons for their fatigue. The term CFS and SCID will not gather much patient support for such a clinical entity. The term MECFS might also be problematic given the small percentage of patients that support this label from our patient poll. The clinical criteria may be, rather than using the word SCID, a new term for the IOM criteria could be considered. For, for example, neuroendocrine dysfunction disease, which is similar to a term that the name change work group of the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Panel of 2003 recommended, ME clinical, would be another possibility, or maybe patient polls could be helped determine what name is best. Those who do not meet criteria for the research and the clinical criteria could be classified as having just chronic fatigue, which is the most general category and represents those with six or more months of fatigue. But this category of chronic fatigue should not be used to bring in patients for studies on ME. But presently, this could have been what happened with the PACE trial. So, to summarize, and again, I've gone through this pretty quickly, but I want to have some time to have a chance to interact with you. The critical issues are developing a consensus about what research case definition to use, which includes the specification of inclusion and exclusion criteria. It's not just enough to say that you have a research criteria. You have to also operationalize it. We also need to develop a consensus among gatekeepers, government, scientists, clinicians, and patients, in differentiating those who meet the IOM clinical criteria from a research criteria. And we also have to come up with a name of both the clinical criteria, although SCID has been proposed, I don't think it has gained much patient support, as well as the research criteria, what to call that. Those are our tasks that we need to face in the upcoming um, future. Okay, I finished with my slideshow. Um, I'm going to now, thank you. Thank you. And again, thank you all for the invitation to um, come to you by Skype. I wish I was there in person, um, but uh, yep. at least I had a chance to uh, give you some of my most recent ideas on case definitions. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm happy to entertain questions. And again, I apologize for going through this relatively quickly, but I thought um, probably the most interesting part would be our exchange back and forth. So, so I'm happy to um, interact with you now with questions. Thank you. Carmen Seibel again from Germany wants to ask you. Yes, hello. Um, uh, I'm from Charity, and uh, we are there in charge of applications as an MBE as well. Um, thanks a lot for this um, uh, overview and this comparison of the different uh, disease criteria, which is very helpful for us. I have um, more comment and a question regarding um, the name. I think, um, and I can only speak for the situation in Germany, we have um, uh, we had a hard time um, to be at least um, the disease recognized as um, 
as we to Germany, to Germany. And then it might be very difficult to rename the disease because it will again take a while until it is recognized at all by physicians. I would rather suggest that we probably should await um, because there are so many um, studies ongoing now on autoimmune um, TT and on metabolic um, uh, disturbances that I hope so, that we probably uh, will um, get a cause in the next um, years which really uh, gives us um, a clue of the pattern mechanism of the diseases. And at the moment we have um, a molecule or an ultra antibody. I think that would be um, ideal situation to um, give the disease the name which really um, shows what the pattern mechanism is. I would like to see what you think about this. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. let, let me just uh, restate your question, make sure I understand it, that there are incredible advances that are now occurring um, by researchers that are beginning to better understand um, some of the um, pathophysiology of this illness, and that it's very likely that um, we might be able to identify some of the causes of this illness, and there might be specific names that could be identified with those causes in the future. Um, so I certainly think that there will be, as with other illnesses, specification of kind of a particular category. So for example, when you think about lung cancer, there's probably 50 to 70 different types of lung cancers, but there's still a title called lung cancer. Um, there's still something that's occurring within that particular patient that one can refer to. For scientists who are publishing, I'm publishing articles right now. Um, if I basically say, um, um, I don't have a name for this, but um, in the future we'll have it, and I basically try to get an article published by saying that, I think I would have significant barriers to publishing my research. I think you would also have significant barriers to publishing your research. When you talk to the media and when you talk to patients, um, if you don't have a name that you can use now, patients are at a disadvantage and we're also at a disadvantage in terms of kind of talking to the media about what this particular illness is. So I think there's all types of disadvantages for us waiting till kind of some future time when more specification could occur. I do think that um, the name change working group of uh, 2000 to 2003, which involved eight people, came up with an interesting concept where they basically said, um, that there's a broad term possibly called neuroendocrine dysfunction syndrome or neuroendocrine dysfunction disease. And they basically said within that, there will be subtypes that will be split off. And that ME might be one, there might be another that we could call something else, um, certainly. So I do think that having um, right now something that we can call this entity other than chronic fatigue syndrome it's probably useful for the patients because the patients don't want to be referred to as having chronic fatigue syndrome. If you want to refer to it as having myalgic encephalomyelitis, I think you'll get a lot of support from the patient community. Um, but then the question is, um, is that the research criteria? Is that the clinical criteria? And will there be other criteria? I personally think that there are different subtypes of patients that exist. Um, some patients, for example, um, have very few um, immunological issues. Some patients have a lot of immunological issues. Some patients have orthostatic intolerance. Some patients don't. We all know that there's lots of different subtypes. These different subtypes might ultimately be called different types, subtypes or names. But today, in 2017, I think we need to basically have some criteria for researchers as well as some names so patients and, and we can um, communicate with journal editors, with patients, and with the larger um, media audience. So I do think that the time is now for us not to just say we don't need a case definition. I think there is not an illness that in history that has basically said, don't worry about the case definition until the future, because that only provides tremendous amount of miscommunications because if everybody is selecting patients using different methods, there's no way of comparing what's going on in different laboratories. So even if we're not 100% correct, if we have a, some names and we have criteria that are common among different research groups, 
we can continue to improve them. We continue to have different subtypes of them, and we make progress to the extent that we say we don't need a case definition, which, as you probably know, is being echoed by a number of people. I think we push the field backwards, not forward. Because even those studies that are very important need to have criteria to select people to bring into the study. And you have to have a definition to select patients into a study. You can't just say, I can bring anyone in. Because if you bring anyone in with chronic fatigue, you see the mischief that occurs with some of the things that have happened um, in the last few years. I fully agree with all of you. I only hesitate. I think we should probably. CFS ME is, is, is a term widely used if you look into the papers of the last year. I'm just hesitating to rename the disease again because many people still haven't acknowledged CFS ME and if you come up with a new disease name every other year, I think we will have a problem. I, don't, I, don't, I can't compare with any other. Um, uh, the disease, though, we have renamed the disease, so that's well, When you say rename the disease, if you were to call this illness myalgic encephalomyelitis, that's not renaming the disease. The dis disease was actually called that in 1988 and earlier. So I think, if anything, if we use that particular term, we're going back to something that Ramsey talked about many years ago in Great Britain. So I'm not sure that's renaming it. If you look at patient organizations, a number of them have renamed their patient organization to ME. So I do think that there's justification for using the ME term, not just among patient polls, but also historically. Um, and in terms of the issue of inflammation, some of the most recent studies are now beginning to understand that that itis of encephalomyelitis might very well be the case with um, you know some types of inflammation that have been found. So, so I do think that ME is the appropriate term. Um, and I think that um, it's not something that um, would, I think it would simplify lots of stuff. Now I recognize that there's a large group of people that are using ME-CFS um, and the number of publications are coming out with that term too. Okay. I, I have a question. I wonder about something, and um, um, because I agree with you that there are subsets in the population, but how can we find it when we start to uh, to uh, to look for biological um, markers? And how can we find the subgroups if we have very strict criteria? But if we if we should find something in in the, let's see ICC those uh, those patients. What, how, what can we know about the, can those who satisfy the Canadian criteria if we don't, <laughs> they are not with us in the, in the, in the, in the research? Well, just it's, wonder. It's, it's an excellent question and it's something that um, has um, sort of puzzled our group for a long time. And, um, and I think there is a strategy around this. Okay, um, with factor analytic studies, you do find several particular symptoms that come up again and again. The PEM, the cognitive impairment, and the sleep difficulties. We see that again and again from multiple studies. So I think we can say there are these three domains within large samples and multiple different samples that have occurred, not just ones that we've collected. But if you're looking for subtypes, which is what you're saying, you're not looking for domains that are common you're looking for individuals who have different types of symptoms. The problem that we've been faced with is that so many patients have these three core problems that they wash out all the other pieces of the subtypes in the analyses that we've done. So we've tried, for example, something called latent class analysis, we've done some latent profile analysis, and we put in all the symptoms. But those three major symptoms suck up all the variants. And when we do it that way, what we end up with is a very severe group and then a, a group that has not severe symptoms. Sometimes we have a very severe group, a middle severe group, and a group that basically has fewer symptoms. That's not helpful. But that's what we published on, and that's what we keep finding. And, and, we, and, and the reason that we ran into this problem was because those three core symptoms suck up all the variants because our patients have them. So. What I would recommend and what our group is now doing 
And again, I thank um, our graduate student, Matt, Madison Sunquist, for coming up with this idea. Um, she took those three major symptoms out of our data, okay? She basically said, we're not going to put them into our statistical analysis. And she took a look at the other symptoms, the ones that are maybe not as frequent. And then she did the same types of statistical analyses. And when we have done it that way, we're now beginning to get the subtypes. Because in a sense, we don't have that, we don't have the symptoms everyone has. We have the people, so in other words, the CCC, the MEICC does indicate that you have to have these core symptoms. That's good enough. Take those symptoms out and then look among the other symptoms for the subtypes. And that's where you're gonna find them because that's what we're finding right now. Okay. Just another question. Do you suggest to, to, uh, to use a four factor solution if you have a field? Um, I, I would not. In research? I, I, I would not um, because um, I, I think it's way too premature for that. Um, and we're actually doing basic research right now on trying to come up with a shortened version of our DePaul symptom questionnaire, which a number of people have asked us to. So until we shorten our questionnaire, we want a very brief questionnaire that can be given as a screen where you can then tick off whether which case definition a person has. And that's what we're working on now. Um, and I think once we get that done, we'll be in a little bit better position to kind of have a briefer screen. Um, but, but I think the big question now is kind of what symptoms make up any of these domains. So for example, um, orthostatic intolerance. Um, you know, there's a paper that was just published by a group um, um, from Stanford. Um, this was Lily Chu. Um, and Montoya. Um, and they basically concluded that the um, SEID criteria um, actually were very comparable to the other criteria that have been used, including um, the FACUDA, including the CCC, including the MEICC. Um, very interesting study that just came out this week in the Fatigue Journal. Well, um, the reason I keep saying it's critically important for us to specify the frequency and severity and specify how we're defining these things is that if you basically look at the Canadian criteria and you look at the MEICC and you use frequency and severity scores that are very minimal. In other words, it occurs in a sense mild and a little of the time. If you use those criteria, then the CCC and the MEICC are like the SCID, which has actually higher frequency and severity criteria. Then they're comparable. But if you use the same frequency and severity across the three illnesses, then you get the separation that the CCC and the MEICC are different. They're basically identifying fewer patients. So if you have researchers like had just been published that saying there's no differences in these criteria, I think what it ends up doing is making a very confusing situation for researchers. And that's why it's so important for us to be specific about what we're doing and have case definitions that we have agreement on so that we can at different labs have comparisons so that we can say what we're doing because I do think that the MEICC and the CCC do select patients who are more severe and they're fewer than the FACUDA does. Just had a phone call came in, so I'm just going to take the phone off the hook. So anyway, I'm, I'm sorry I'm getting a little bit off task here, but um, as you can see, I have very strong feelings and I don't have a problem expressing them, as you all know. <laughs> Okay, so at this point, do you uh, suggest us to use FACUDA or Canadian criteria? So, so I think right now, um, if I were to make a suggestion, um, I would say that um, probably the um, SCID clinical criteria could be used for a clinical criteria because it's a very broad criteria. Um, and I do have problems with it being very broad um, and is it being used to bring in lots of patients? Fine. If that's what you want to do, it will bring in lots of patients. 
But I do think if you're going to use the clinical criteria, then you need something that's more narrow to get a more homogeneous impaired group. And that can be one of a variety of things. The Canadian criteria does bring in a smaller, more impaired group. If you use the same standards, in other words, if you use the same frequency and severity standards of our questionnaire, the call symptom questionnaire, you get a different group. But if you basically use frequency and severity standards that are very lenient, then you're gonna again get a very wide group even using the Canadian criteria. So that's why this is so important. Okay. So yes, you could use the Canadian criteria as a research criteria. You could use the IOM as a clinical criteria, um, but there's other possible research criteria. For example, you could use fibromyalgia plus the IOM. You could use homebound plus the IOM. These are two papers that we actually have just published that have suggested that if you add something on two clinical criteria, you get a more homogeneous, more impaired group. So there's a variety of different possibilities. The key thing and the key challenge for us is as researchers to, to come to a consensus and say, yes, we're gonna use these types of criteria and that way we can compare and contrast our different studies without the ability to compare and contrast what different people are doing in different labs, we're really back to, to step zero. We have to have criteria that identifies who has, who doesn't have the illness to be able to communicate with one another. I might add, there's no other illness that basically says you don't need to have a case definition to basically have progress in the field. I ask you to name an illness beside the common cold and that is an illness um, that basically doesn't require some criteria. They all do. And that's why we as a field need to do that also. Okay. And when you're talking about frequency and severity, I'm thinking about the default questionnaire. Which should, could that be a good alternative to assess symptoms and to classify for the researchers? So the DePaul symptom questionnaire has been under development at DePaul University for many years. Um, we have um, at least seven to eight publications on it. We have um, construct validity. We have test retest validity. We've had independent groups use the questionnaire and come up with actually re relatively comparable results. So that shares with us that um, we have a questionnaire that at least asks same questions to the same people and basically has the same stems and the same frequency. So the, for example, the frequency is zero, none at all, one a little, two half the time, three most of the time, four all of the time. So we have all the symptoms rated on that frequency. And we say for a symptom to count for the CCC or the MEICC, it has to be at least half the time, most of the time, or all of the time. So we have criteria. Now we might be completely wrong with that criteria, but at least we've specified it and we're using it to do data analyses. The severity is the same way. We basically say a person has zero symptoms, so it's zero, one mild, moderate, three is severe, four is very severe. So a person has to have at least two, moderate to severe to very severe. So that's why I say two is moderate, two is at least half the time. If a symptom is at least moderate half the time, we count it as a symptom. Again, the reason we look at both frequency and severity, some symptoms are very severe, but they only occur once every couple months. So it's not impacting the person. So that's why, in a sense, even though a symptom is very severe, it's not as important if it doesn't occur frequently. There's some symptoms that occur every day, like, you know, for example, some pains, but that their, their severity is so mild that it's not disruptive to the person. So if you don't have both of these domains, you're not able to capture what's insignificant, what is impactful, what's impairing. That's why we say if a symptom is moderate at at least half the time, we know it's a, it's a meaningful, significant symptom for the patient, and then we count them. But if you basically don't have any, in a sense, consensus as to what counts as a symptom, and that is the case now,
for research criteria, at least, then we have major problems. And, and as I said, this article that just came out um, a couple of days ago in the Fatigue Journal by colleagues of mine who I like and I feel very good about, but I'm also okay with criticizing their work because they changed basically the numbers so that one mild and, two, and one a little can count as a symptom for the CCC and the MEICC. And I think if you count mild and a little as a symptom, yeah, then you get very different results than if you basically count moderate and half the time as a symptom. I think it's critically important for us to make those determinations a consensus among the scientific community. And our failure to do that has impacted the quality, the level, and the communications of researchers across the world. Okay, okay, so um, can, can we translate the Polish uh, symptom questionnaire into the European language? Um, actually, um, the questionnaire has been translated into um, quite a few different languages at this point. Um, our Norwegian colleagues are using it, and it's in Nor Norwegian. Um, we also have Japanese colleagues that are using it. We have some Middle East countries that are using it. Um, we have um, people in Mexico um, using it in Spanish. So it's been translated into actually quite a few languages at this point. Okay, thank you. Luis, Luis, I have a question. No, 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 no,
Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.